All right, day 14, doing the um, uh, video today for Movember. And uh, Mo's sort of coming in, bit of shape. Never like him when there's not much hair on it, but it's coming okay. Um, today I want to draw from the material of Patrick Carnes. Um, Patrick in the 80s wrote um, Out of the Shadows on sex addiction and sort of changed the world, really, I think. Um, the... Um, uh, over the years has become an expert on addiction and trauma and really taking seriously what even to this day um, there's a lot of argument about but the World Health Organization has now got an official diagnosis for sex addiction but lots of people come in the other day I did some stuff on the criteria of addiction and um, definition am I an addict well you know and I talked about the stages of change well um, when Patrick put his 30-point plan together on how to get well from an addiction, uh, the first, uh, this, this book is the first seven tasks out of that 30-point plan. Um, he he um, starts with the, the absolute importance of working out what is real, right? It's recognizing self-delusion. So I want to read a little bit out of the front of this, and then he talks about what's in, how, you know, how do we help someone, or how do we help ourselves break that delusion? So... What is real? Recognizing self-delusion by uh, Patrick Carnes, chapter one. Mental health is a commitment to reality at all costs. That's an M. Scott Peck, road less traveled, uh, quote. Addiction is an illness of escape. Its goal is to obliterate, medicate, and ignore reality. Uh, it is the alternative to letting self, oneself feel hurt, betrayal, worry, and most painful of all, loneliness. The hardest challenge for some addicts is acknowledging that they have a problem. Addiction cripples the core ability to know what is real, our most essential skill. Addicts weave a string of rationalizations and delusions that make it impossible to cope with details like families and jobs. You know, not the big ticket items, it, it, you know, this, uh, our essential inability to be present means that, that the really important things in our life get lost. In this chapter, we will look at why denial holds such a strong sway over addicts and what to do to counter it. We will define addiction and who is likely to become an addict. Addiction often begins simply. Reality becomes too much to bear, so we try to escape through drugs, alcohol, or sex. Escaping reality for even the briefest time brings some relief, but when escaping becomes habitual, we have a mental illness known as addiction. If mental health can be defined as... M. Scott Peck says, a commitment to reality no matter what the cost, then addiction can be defined as its most direct opposite, evading reality no matter the cost, though it may even bring death. Reality distortion starts in the family. Sex addicts typically come from families in which addiction is already present. Often grandparents, parents, siblings, or extended family members struggle with alcoholism, compulsive gambling, nicotine addiction, e eating disorders, illicit drug abuse, or compulsive sex. Even more likely, those family members battle with a combination of addictions. I think in... Um, uh, the, the general path through the 12 steps, uh, Patrick reveals some uh, research there where he says 87% of people, if they've got one addiction, have two or more. And, and I think that's just based on the fact we've got a disease of the brain. It's, it, it affects our reward memory and motivational circuitry. So it doesn't really care what, what, it, what floats your boat. We'll have a variety, a hybrid of, of activities. Stop one, another one will do. That's where that, that concept of whack-a-mole comes up. That's like if I knock one down, if I'm not addressing the underlying issue and the depth and coming out of delusion, another one will just take its place. So, <coughs> excuse me. As children, sex addicts grow up in environments where there is a classic elephant in the living room syndrome. Everyone pretends there is no problem, although a huge issue looms, interfering with everyone's lives. In such, in such a situation... Children learn to look at addiction and yet not see it. The second one is, sex addicts also tend to come from rigid authoritarian families. These are families in which all issues and problems are black and white, little is negotiable, and there is only one way to do things. Success in the family means doing what the parents want to such an extent that children give up being who they are. Normal child development does not happen. By the time children enter adolescence, they have few options. One option is to become rebellious. The other option is to develop a secret life the family knows nothing about. Both positions distort reality, both result in a distrust of authority and a poor sense of self. 
If the family's rigidity is also sex negative, that is, children are taught that sex is dirty, sinful, bad, or nasty, then sex becomes exaggerated or hidden. Worse yet, the forbidden may become the object of obsession. Or all of the above happens. In the worst case scenario, the child finds out the parents are not living up to their own sexual standards. Uh, for example, if the parents preach against sexual promiscuity, but one or both are chronically have affairs, the child learns that sexual duplicity is acceptable. The norm is to deceive others and to pretend that what is true is not fact. And uh, certainly I think a voice in this area is Ted Roberts. Uh, I've been doing some work from this book, Pure Desire, and um, certainly talking about the rigidity that can happen in a Christian home and then these morals that we're supposed to live up to and then when the parents don't do that. Uh, and, and if not the parents, the pastor or the priest, you know, so many people that are sexually abused by uh, some sort of clergy or, or minister or pastor um, has the same effect and the duplicitous um, nature of that just cuts at the fabric of, of, of trust uh, for, for children. Um, one essential way to check the reality is to share um, is to share with others and find out their perceptions of a situation. This requires a capacity for intimacy. Most sex addicts, however, come from families in which members are disengaged from one another. There is little intimacy. Children in such homes develop few skills for sharing, being vulnerable, or risking anything about themselves. As a result, they learn to trust no one. The further result is that self-delusion the further result is that self-delusion is then hard to break and secrets become more potent than reality. The worst effect is that children are unable to ask for help. So abuse and neglect lead to more distortion. Children who are neglected conclude they're not valuable. Abuse and neglect deepen the distrust of others and further distort reality. In addition, they live with a high level of anxiety because no one teaches them basic life skills or provides for their essential needs. Children in such situations find ways to deaden the anxiety they inevitably feel. They do so compulsively. For sex addicts, anxiety reduction strategies may include acts such as compulsive masturbation. Food and alcohol can be controlled by parents, but it is difficult to stop a young person from masturbating. Physical and sexual abuse also intensify poor self-esteem and the need for relief from fear. Abuse victims tend to distort reality. They can overreact or underrespond to life problems. Being terrified makes them reactive. Further, they often compartmentalize, that is, they learn to split reality and to acknowledge parts of their life but disallow and deny problem areas. That may mean acting a certain way in, a, in one context and totally different in another. They may pretend that a, that a reality in their life, such as having a dead sibling or a family member who is in prison, does not exist. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote about this compartmentalization when he described Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Hyde personified the monster underneath the normal exterior of Dr. Jekyll. Stevenson was essentially describing the phenomenon of alcoholism, but it is an apt metaphor for all forms of addiction. A final characteristic of abuse um, victims is that they tend to distort or minimize the impact of abuse. It was not so bad, didn't hurt me much, this adds another layer to reality distortion. And I know in the work of Pia Melody, she certainly presents that we have to come out of denial of our trauma because our natural um, disconnection and repression and suppression uh, really colors the way that we see our history. So that is certainly a big part of addiction treatment. So getting used to distortion, and, and I won't give all the examples in this book, but Patrick goes through and says, sex addicts have such experience in distorting reality that they become comfortable with it. And here are some extreme examples. So I'll just give two. A 35-year-old man is president of a company owned by his wife's family. He has been sexually involved with his wife's sister on and off for over three years. He thinks his wife will not find out, and even if she did, he would not lose the company he has built with her family money. Um, a married woman uh, has sex in high-risk situations, including restrooms, bars, and restaurants. One man secretly uses his smartphone to make a video of their encounter. He threatens then to send it to her husband if she does not continue to have sex with him. So we can, we can really think we've got control of this, we can manage it, and then, and then really the, the ability to distort reality, which started in childhood, becomes a huge issue for adults. So, recovery. In each of these cases, and he gives a lot more in here um, in the book, 
In each of these cases, the truth came out with horrible results. Every one of those people was stunned by his or her capacity for self-delusion. I mean, I do see people that, that turn up in session and their life is literally blown up and they really thought it was going to, um, they were going to be able to manage this, that it wasn't going to happen. So focusing on reality, the above example ex illustrate why we start looking at denial. As you progress in recovery, you will begin to understand how the process of denial has worked for you. Our purpose now is to simply say it is normal at this point to be confused. It is also normal to punish yourself because you feel bad and guilty about your sexual behavior. And it is likely true that you have not been honest with yourself or others. It will, however, be easy to see how you got to this point. There are two challenges. First, you must be honest with yourself. Then you, must, you need to be honest with those who can help you, such as a therapist or your support group. This may surprise you, but I suggest that, that you wait to tell your spouses, family, friends, and bosses about your sexual activity until one, you understand what is wrong, and two, you have support from people who understand your problem, such as a certified sex addiction therapist. So uh, Ted Roberts certainly talks about that in Pure Desire. Um, this idea here is that we really have to understand the problem and we've got to get some support. People out of guilt sometimes just go and confess and traumatize people when it's like the, what we're really being challenged to do is, is to, to own the problem and come out of this delusion. So what can you do now? There are three action steps. There are three action steps and that can help you begin to focus on reality. One, first list what you think your problems are. This list will be an important resource as you go through your recovery process. This is going to capture the unmanageability of your life. Second, as you review those problems, notice what secrets you have. So in regards to those problems, what secrets do you have? In other words, how many instances can you find in which people are unaware of the truth? The, these are cases in which you have told lies, failed to tell the whole story, or decided to tell nothing at all. So many people understand that if I tell a lie, that's dishonest, but there's a bit of confusion around dishonesty through omission, and addicts are largely dishonest through omission. You didn't ask. I didn't lie. Finally, ask yourself what excuses and rationales you use for your sexual behavior. Make every effort to be as honest as possible. We will start to work here on breaking through these barriers to reality. They are the focus of the next three exercises in this chapter. Doing them may be hard at first, but take heart and continue on. This process has worked for countless others before you. So it's that list of what are my problems um, what are the secrets associated with those? And then what are my excuses and rationales? Those things, two things, the three things are very important. So journaling is a tool and, and Patrick goes on to talk about the absolute importance that, you know, journaling, slowing the head down to the speed of the hand. As you go through this workbook, I encourage you to keep a journal, use it to record reflections and notes about the exercises in the book. This will be valuable to you as time goes on. You can use your journal if you run out of room to write in this workbook, feel free to record the overflow. Remember to keep the process simple. Many people find a cheap spiral notebook serves as a perfect repository for their reflections. Others prefer a leather bound diary with high quality paper. The choice is entirely yours. So do whatever works for you. So to keep your journal organized, label your responses with exercises and the page numbers in the book. You know, So um, I must say I learned to journal in early recovery and, and slowing my head down to the speed of my hand was really valuable. So this tool today is just how do we break delusion? The other thing that's, that goes on in this book is, is Patrick, after he gets you to name the problems and the secrets and the excuses, um, he then goes on to do a, con a consequence inventory. But in the consequence inventory, it's a tick box, right? Because he makes the point in, the, in, in his uh, criteria of addiction that the most striking manifestation of, of, of addiction is the addict's ability to minimize use and consequence. So the first three lists get, get sort of our unmanageability and our use out. The consequences, he, he, he does, he does the, the tick box because it's really trying to pull out of us. Uh, this ability that we have to compartmentalize and repress and push things down. Um, the back end of this looks at denial. I will make the denial stuff another 
um, looking at your denial type and what types you use. I'll make that another video for November. So this has been day 14. Um, please be gentle with your heart as you travel on the recovery road and I'm going to drive up the mountains today. I just had a group and I've got a couple of clients, but I'm going to go up and visit some friends and do some fellowship up in the mountains. Um, so I'm going to take the mustache on the road. The photos today will be uh, about the, I've got a mustache on the front of my bike, so it's all for fun. Uh, but, the, but the issue is serious. It's men's health. So please donate to Movember, if not to my own account, but to someone else's. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.